Virginie Barberet. I'm a French veterinarian uh, as I am a diplomat of the European College of Diagnostic uh, Imaging, uh, so in veterinary medicine. I am uh, working at the moment at Ghent University when I'm preparing a PhD and I will uh, present to you the uh, ultrasonographic examination of the abdomen of uh, small animals. Okay. Essa dúvida, esse impasse frio no verão. Esse estranho inverno. So in this presentation we'll see the ultrasonographic examination of the gastrointestinal tract of small animals. So first for the indications of the ultrasonographic examination uh, we'll have uh, the vomiting of course, so chronic or acute vomiting uh, are always reasons to uh, do an ultrasonographic uh, examination. We have the diarrhea as well, but then more uh, it will be more indicated to do an ultrasonographic examination in case of chronic diarrhea. Uh, in the cases of acute diarrhea, it's in general due to infectious or parasitic causes, so it's often not necessary to um, uh, to perform an ultrasonographic examination. But in case of chronic diarrhea, it can be due to neoplasia, uh, so then it's of course uh, more important to check uh, with ultrasound. We can have also weight loss or anorexia uh, that are clinical signs of uh, gastrointestinal problems, um, hypoproteinemia, uh, if there is blood loss, so hematemesis or melina, for example, if we have to look for an ulcer in this uh, gastrointestinal tract, or in case of abdominal pain or tenesmus, for example. So what is important uh, in those animals, but it's also important for every ultrasonographic examination of the abdomen, is that the animal should be fasted for at least 12 hours. Uh, we should have an empty stomach and an empty GI tract. Uh, if uh, there is too much food or too much ingesta in the intestinal tract, it's more difficult to assess the wall uh, of the intestines and uh, more difficult to get uh, to reach to, uh, diagnosis. Uh, we have to keep in mind that the gastrointestinal gas interferes a lot with the examination of the GI tract but also of uh, the rest of the abdomen. Uh, of course, there's nothing uh, much we can do about it but to keep the animal fasted, it's already a, a good uh, way to, to have less gas in the intestinal tract. So we first start with the stomach. So the stomach is located in the cranial abdomen. So in general, it will be partially under the ribs. So we will need an approach through the, through the ribs, but also just caudal to the costal arch. The stomach is uh, quite easily recognized because of the rugal folds like we can see here on this image. So that's the folds in the stomach and it's often containing a, a small to large amount of gas depending. There is also um, a prominent hyperechoic mucosa in cats. So we have all the layers here of the stomach wall. So uh, hyperechoic serosa muscularis and the submucosa is hyperechoic and in cats it will be very prominent, very thick because in those cats they can have some fat infiltration in this submucosal layer uh, and then it will be very well visible. The peristaltic movements uh, are in general consisting of four to five contractions per minute and the normal wall thickness will be between three and five millimeter. So we have to evaluate the whole stomach from the fundus to the body and to the pyloric region. The pyloric region is uh, represented here and here it's a duodenum, here it's the pylorus. This area has to be uh, examined closely, for example, if we look for foreign bodies, but also if we have some uh, uh, hypertrophic uh, uh, infiltration of the mucosa, or hypertrophy of the mucosa that can create some delayed gastric emptying and uh, can create some uh, vomiting problems in dogs. We have also to check the intestines, so first the duodenum with the proximal part that can be sometimes difficult to access because it can be under the ribs, uh, especially in deep chested dogs. So again we will have to use an intercostal approach. 
Then the descending duodenum is more easily visible because it will be located superficially along the right abdominal wall and uh, it will be located ventral to the right kidney. So more easily visible uh, on the right side of the uh, abdomen. The duodenal papilla is sometimes visible. We see it here in cross section. Here we can see it as well entering the duodenum. It's not always visible, but when it is, it's, uh, it looks like that. So the duodenal thickness is about 3 to 6 mm uh, thick in dogs. It, uh, of course, a bit less in cats, so measuring from here to here, um, that's the normal thickness. The duodenum is the largest intestinal loop uh, in the abdomen. Then we have the other intestines, small intestines or jejunal ileum. Uh, they will be mostly located on the right side, but we can find some on the left side as well. Uh, the thickness, like we can see here, measured again from the uh, mucosal interface to the serosa, will have to be between 3 and 5 mm in dogs. The cecum will be located in the right cranial abdomen and uh, the colon. Uh, contain air and feces, so like here it will always create a dark uh, shadow because of the air present in the uh, colon. So often with the colon we'll be only able to see the ventral wall but not the dorsal wall because of those artifacts. The wall of the colon is uh, uh, presenting the same layers as in the small intestines but it, it's much smaller so it will be maximum 2 to 3 mm in thickness. Uh, the colon is uh, represented of uh, three parts, so we have the ascending colon on the right, the transverse caudal to the stomach, and the descending colon on the left side. Finally, for the layers of the uh, GI tract, so I told you there were different types of layers, so we see them here, so we start with the mucosal interface, which is hyperechoic and uh, it's a line in the center. Then we have the uh, mucosal line, so hypoechoic, which is in general the thicker part of the wall of the small intestines. Then the submucosa, which is hypoechoic. Then the muscularis hypoechoic and the serosa hypoechoic again. So when we measure the intestinal wall or gas uh, gastric wall, we have to measure from the mucosal interface to the serosa. And like we see here, again, it should be less than 5 mm in dogs. In the uh, intestinal tract, we can have some different patterns. So we can have food in the stomach, and that's uh, a problem because then those particles food of food, they will uh, really stop the ultrasound beam, so they can create very strong shadows and they can mimic some uh, foreign bodies. So it's really a problem then to assess the complete wall of the stomach. We can have also ingesta in the small intestine, so in general it would be like uh, isoechoic cellular fluid, uh, sometimes a bit hypoechoic if there is gas mixed within the fluid. We can have uh, pure fluid within the intestine, so then it will be completely anechoic. Uh, we can have gas, of course, and that will be the most common, so it will be hypoechoic with the uh, shadowing and comet tails that will pre prevent the uh, evaluation of the structures that are situated underneath. So what we will have to look for in those gastrointestinal diseases is we will have to evaluate the wall thickness uh, of the gastrointestinal tract, but we will have also to evaluate the layering. So the layering should be always visible, except in large dogs where we have to use a uh, ultrasound probe with a low frequency to uh, go deep. Uh, within the abdomen and then we will, lose, uh, we will lose some resolution of the image and then the layering won't be so easily visible in those cases. If we have a lesion, we have to evaluate its size, the transition zone with the normal gastrointestinal tract. Uh, we will have to evaluate also, um, if we have a lesion, the, the, well, the draining lymph nodes. So mostly it will be the jejunal lymph nodes uh, that are in general visible in dogs, but also in cats, in, even in normal animals. But we will also have to evaluate the uh, uh, other lymph nodes if there is a colic problem, for example, so then we have to evaluate the uh, colic lymph nodes or the 
codal mesentric lymph nodes, for example. Um, we have also to evaluate the content and the motility of the, the GI tract. So, first example, or one of the most common uh, problem we get in the gastrointestinal tract, it's a foreign body. Um, so, some of them present really a typical aspect on ultrasonography. So, they show a hyperechoic surface here. That's due to the fact that the foreign body is reflecting a lot the ultrasounds and uh, so then it's becoming hyperechoic and then there is a strong acoustic shadow underneath because this um, this uh, foreign body stops completely the ultrasound and then nothing is penetrating through it. Some foreign bodies are sonolucent meaning that in fact they let pass like here this ball for example uh, let pass completely the ultrasound beam so it's almost creating like a cyst like lesions filled with fluid but that's a, a ball so it's uh, sonolucent and then we can see completely through through this uh, foreign body here and here we have the intestinal wall so we are sure it's within an intestine uh, the foreign body, they can create some plication of the small intestine, so it will be more an undulating um, appearance of the small intestines. It will be mostly if the foreign body are linear, uh, that's the most common foreign bodies we can find in cats. So then the, the foreign body stays within the lumen, but then all the intestines are just uh, grouped around this foreign body and then plicated. We can observe uh, a secondary obstructive ileus in general with those foreign bodies, uh, meaning that uh, they uh, in fact obstruct completely the intestinal lumen and then there is a distension of the intestines uh, cranial to this foreign body with fluid and gas uh, because nothing can pass through the uh, lumen of the intestine anymore and then we have this uh, mechanical obstruction uh, pattern uh, with a very severely distended loops uh, on ultrasound. We can see them sometimes also on radiography. What we have to look for also if uh, there are signs of uh, perforations, especially if the foreign body is pointy uh, or sharp, uh, if it's uh, wood or needles, for example. So then we'll have to look for uh, focal peritonitis, if there is free abdominal gas, uh, thickening of the wall of the intestine and loss of layering at the level of the perforation, for example.